Welcome back to my Constellation series, a science, lore, and history backyard astrophotography grand tour. I'm Michael, and this video is all about Ursa Major and Minor and the North Star. But you probably know these better as the Big Dipper and Little Dipper. With each episode, I like to talk about different aspects of astronomy and astrophotography. And for this episode, the theme will be navigating the stars and navigating with the stars. But let's start with where to find them. The top question I'm asked about the night sky from friends and family sometimes even complete strangers, is how do I find the Little Dipper? And I love the excitement it gives people who see it with their own eyes for the very first time. It's often a misidentified constellation as well. Several other groupings of stars kind of look like a spoon or a bowl or a cup and are smaller than the Big Dipper. And I think there's a good reason why the Little Dipper is misidentified so much. The real one isn't actually that easy to spot on its own, but once you know how, it's not that hard at all. The first thing to look for is the Big Dipper. For people living in the Northern Hemisphere, this is one of the easiest star groupings to find. For most people in the North, just look North. Chances are pretty good that you live in a place where the Big Dipper is visible every night of the year. The Big Dipper is what we call circumpolar for anyone north of about 34 degrees in latitude, meaning all of Europe and about two thirds of North America and much of Northern Asia can see all of the Big Dipper every single night of the year. Look for the familiar handle and bowl. Most of the stars in the Big Dipper are fairly bright too and visible from all but the worst light polluted skies. The next step is to find the North Star or Polaris. Earth's north polar axis points almost exactly at Polaris, hence the name. That means Polaris doesn't appear to move much compared to other stars in the sky. Its position is always due north from wherever you are standing, save for being at the North Pole itself. To find it, take a peek at the shape of the Big Dipper. Locate the open end of the bowl. Now draw a straight line with your eyes, roughly five times the distance from the two stars at the end of the bowl, and you've found Polaris the North Star. To find the Little Dipper, you're going to need to be pretty far away from city lights. Ideally, a rural night sky or about the edge of the suburbs where light pollution isn't a major factor. In a very dark sky, far from light pollution, the Little Dipper becomes difficult to find again, lost in a sea of thousands of other dim stars. From the North Star, walk your eyes back in an arc that leans back to the middle of the handle of the Big Dipper. About one third of the distance back, you'll find two stars that aren't quite as bright as Polaris. These two stars are called Furcad and Kocheb, and these stars are at the end of the bowl of the Little Dipper. By now, the hope is that your eyes have adjusted enough to see the four rather dimly lit stars between Polaris and the end of the bowl of the Little Dipper. And there it is. But what we've actually looked at so far aren't formal constellations. The Little Dipper and Ursa Minor are basically the same stars to one another, while the Big Dipper is actually part of a much larger constellation, Ursa Major. The Dippers are asterisms, or groups of stars that are culturally significant, but not astronomically the same thing as their parent constellations. And looking at the entire constellation of Ursa Major and its relative size to Ursa Minor, we can now start to see what these constellations represent. A great bear and a little bear. Ursa is the Latin word for bear, and it's still used in taxonomy to represent bears, ursids, or things that are bear-like, or ursidae. Ursa Major and Minor are constellations visible only from the Northern Hemisphere. But put a better way, they represent much of the Northern Hemisphere. In Greek, the word for bear and these two constellations is arctos, and that's the root word for the word we use in English for Arctic. Or you can think of these northern lands as the land of the bear, both literally where bears are most common, and also the land where the two bears, Ursa Major and Minor, are visible. Alaska. What a joke. Bro, your flag's in space. How is that unique to your place? You can see that from f***ing anywhere on Earth, you dummies. Big dip, like, get a dip. Drunk vexillologist is drunk. Almost half of the Earth and nearly one billion people can never see the big or little dippers without traveling north. Sadly, another three billion people must travel out of their city before most of Ursa Major's stars are visible. Alaska, the epitome of the Arctic, has Ursa Major and the North Star as its state flag, designed by an Alaskan seventh grader in the 1920s. And to me, the story and symbolism make Alaska's state flag one of my favorites. In nearly all of my Northern Lights videos, you'll probably have little trouble finding Polaris or Ursa Major. So when watching for Northern Lights from high Northern latitudes, 
there's no need for a compass. Find Ursa Major, find Polaris, and now you're looking north, ready for when a display is to begin or to orient your camera in the right direction. But it isn't just Europeans that realize the somewhat bearish shape of this constellation. Many Native American and First Nations recognized or even deified the bear up above. But one story I came across was particularly interesting to me personally. Now I'm gonna bet that most people don't think of this vertical orientation of Ursa Major or the Big Dipper with the bowl up top and the handle pointing down. Ursa Major typically looks like this at the very beginning of spring or the very late part of winter just after dark, which is why I'm bundled up pretty good. But the reason I'm showing you Ursa Major in this orientation is because I got a very cool story I want to tell you. There's a Crow Nation Native American legend that's loosely associated with this constellation. One particularly revered spirit is the Great Bear up above. Some of these Crow Nation oral legends have been written down in a book called Two Leggings, and it tells a story of Bear Whitechild and his encounter with the spirit, the Great Bear up above. Bear Whitechild was in a bit of an exile, so to speak. He was wandering on the plains when a sudden storm blew up in the distance. There was lightning, there was very large hail, things that you would associate with a very strong, probably a supercell thunderstorm. There's even descriptions of the shape of the storm in the story. The storm overtook Bear Whitechild and the hail was landing all around him and he thought he was gonna get killed by hailstones. Suddenly in the cloud, he saw what looked like the head of the great bear up above and it began to dangle down to the ground. And Bear Whitechild said it made a singing sound when it came down. But instead of running away, he actually just let the storm take him. But what he's describing sounds loosely like a tornado possibly with a wall cloud up above it. And so that makes for a really weird way to think of the Big Dipper as actually being a tornado. The tornado quite possibly looked like Great Bear up above in this vertical orientation. So yeah, I made you somehow associate a constellation with a tornado. It goes on in the story to say that uh, the Great Bear up above actually lifted up Bear White Child and set him back down several times, like has been known to happen with some tornadoes. I just thought I'd share this fun little tidbit that only an astronomy storm chasing nerd would probably fully appreciate. From using star navigation to find Polaris and the Little Dipper, to navigating with the stars. Polaris can help any Northern Hemisphere dweller find due north, that's for certain, but it can also tell you your latitude on Earth. Using a device called a sextant, one could pretty accurately determine their distance from the North Pole. The angle in degrees from a flat horizon, say for example, an ocean surface, and Polaris tells you your latitude on Earth. This has been one of the many traditional navigational tools all over the world for thousands of years, GPS, before GPS was a thing. Unlike GPS, the Iridium satellite network can be used for two-way voice and data communication where nothing ground-based is available for navigation or communication. The Iridium network has the Big Dipper as its logo. A fitting logo for something often used when only the most primitive forms of navigation or communication would otherwise be available. Ursa Major even serves as a bit of a climate calendar of seasons. If we are just looking after sunset, it dives in the fall. In winter, like the temperature, it's at its lowest. In spring, it rises. And in summer, like the temperatures, it's at its highest. Looking at the second star in the handle of the Big Dipper inside Ursa Major, there's actually two stars there, a visual double star, Mizar and its fainter companion, Alcor. Arabic words meaning apron and the forgotten one, respectively. Cited in the history books as being used as a bit of an eye test, in reality, they aren't that difficult to see even with fairly poor eyesight. However, you'll want a fairly large telescope for this region anyway, because believe it or not, this visual double is a double-double. Both Alcor and Mizar can be split into two stars each with enough magnification. Doubles within a double. And if you are a fan of 90s disaster movies, these are the two stars being referred to when a fictional comet was discovered in the movie Deep Impact. The Great Bear and Little Bear are quite removed from the glow of the Milky Way. And while not at all devoid of other stars, this area gives us our first opportunity in this series to see objects far from our own galaxy. And to find them, we need at least a small telescope and a little bit more star navigation. Astronomers and astrophotographers call this old school method star hopping. Without computerized telescopes or precision guiding equipment, it's still possible to point an inexpensive telescope or a good pair of binoculars at the right place to find deep sky objects. For example, locate the very end of the handle of the Big Dipper. On roughly either side of it, you'll find two of the most popular galaxies. 
below the handle and at almost 90 degrees, and about half the distance between the last two stars of the handle, you'll find the Whirlpool Galaxy, M51. While tiny, this iconic night sky object is recognizable to almost anyone who's ever looked at images from Hubble or casually perused an astronomy website or magazine. On the other side of the handle, form an equilateral triangle with the last two stars in the handle of the Big Dipper. Here you will find the iconic Pinwheel Galaxy, M101. For fun, this was my first attempt to take a picture of a galaxy through a telescope. About 10 years ago, compare that to Hubble. It's almost as good, right? While these are two wonderful night sky objects, we've only just begun. Take a wide field, long exposure image tucked in just behind the bowl of the Big Dipper, and you'll find dozens more galaxies, including M106. This spacewalking image of just a few degrees of sky provides a lonely feeling. We are a speck on a rock, orbiting a star in a galaxy of millions of stars. And in just one small part of the sky are hundreds more galaxies. And this isn't even considered a crowded neighborhood of galaxies in the scheme of things. To find the Owl Nebula, draw a line between the bottom two stars and the bowl. Divide that line into three sections. Point your telescope at the section nearest to the end of the bowl. And there it is. Owl is a tiny planetary nebula, so you'll want a bigger telescope than what I'm using to appreciate its two wide eyes. For the last target, draw a line from the inside corner of the bowl to the tip of the spoon, so to speak. Then double it. There you will find M81 and M82 two more well-known galaxies. Polaris, the tip of the handle of the Little Dipper, won't actually be the North Star forever. Earth's axis wobbles over the course of a few thousand years, a process called precession. The Earth's axis will have wandered away from Polaris, rendering its original name rather meaningless someday. In my 40 years on Earth, the axis has moved from here, relative to Polaris, to here. So yeah, this change can be quite noticeable over a human lifetime. If you are a young person just getting into astrophotography, make a star trail photo with a telephoto lens centered on Polaris. In 40 or 50 years, do it again and compare the results. Even over a human's lifespan, many things change in the night sky in measurable ways. Thanks for checking out my grand tour of Ursa Major and Minor. My hope is that I've introduced you to something new and that you've learned something with me. I have lots more constellation projects underway but they do take a long time to produce. So subscribe to see the next one, or check out my Orion or Cygnus videos right now. This channel covers the outdoors, astronomy, astrophotography, and extreme weather. So check out my channel page to see if any of that other stuff might interest you. So until the next one, clear skies. Get out there and learn something new.